This is Beyond Perception, where it's all about breaking out of limited perception and waking up to our human potential, our true self, and our connectedness with all life. I'm Simon Rilling, and I'm thrilled to have Dave Lopez as my guest today. He served as a U.S. Navy SEAL and is a subject matter expert on tactical operations, classified global counterterrorism operations, protection, security, and close quarter combat tactics. Since leaving the U.S. Navy, Dave has trained over 20 SWAT teams around the U.S. in advanced tactics and close quarters combat. He has also instructed numerous special response teams of the Department of Homeland Security. Dave has conducted multiple rescue missions formerly with Operation Underground Railroad and currently with Covenant Rescue Group, organizations that fight sex tra traffickers around the world, which directly led to the rescue of over 200 children and the rest of over 50 traffickers. He now serves as a special projects manager for Blackwater and conducts security operations around the world for select clients. He is currently the COO of Watersmark, a luxury development company. Welcome to the show, Dave. Thank you so much for having me, Simon. Yeah, what an incredible introduction. And I'm really, really curious to um, like delve into this conversation. But before we talk about what you're currently doing, I'm really curious because from what I've heard, the training to become a SEAL is really intense and only around 10% of people make it through. Is that, is that true? Like, how, how was your experience? Um, I I think um, the 10% number is probably a little high. Um, it was a very tough training pipeline uh, for sure. Um, I, I, you know, looking back on it as a, you know, I'm in my late thirties now about to be in my forties. I look back on it and go, how on earth did I do that? But I was, a, I was a very young guy in my early twenties and I was motivated and really that's what it takes to get through that. You just have to want it more than everyone else. But Our class, our class started up with close to 300 people and ended up graduating close to 35 people. So it's a pretty, it's a, it's a pretty tough thing. You know, they, they test you and they make sure the, to deprive you of sleep and get, keep you cold, wet, and sandy as much as possible. And just try to, they just try to figure out who wants it more and uh, who, who really wants to be there. And then they start, after they do that process of, beating you up a little bit and seeing how committed you are, then they, then they start to invest into you. If you get through that, then they start to invest real training into you um, and for the rest of the, the training pipeline. But at the beginning, it's a pretty tough, pretty tough time. I'm, I'm, I still, I look back wondering what on earth was I doing? <laughs> uh, you, you just mentioned motivation um, being very important to make it through. Like what was your motivation at that time to join the, the SEALs? Yeah, I could, I could probably tell you that I could give you all kinds of reasons that it's to protect the country, that it was to do all, you know, because of patriotism. But the, I think the real, the honest answer to that is uh, I was trying to figure out who I was. And I had, I was in my early 20s, you know, that stage of life where your, your life could go a thousand different directions and you're not really sure what you want to be in life, you know, and you're looking at this, you're looking at that, you're trying to make a decision on like, who am I, what am I supposed to even do? And so when I saw this opportunity, I, I saw this more as a way of, I want to, I want to figure out who I am and I want to kind of establish my own identity uh, first and foremost uh, for myself. Um, and I think, I think a lot of young guys at that age are, are looking to, Uh, find their own identity um, and figure out what that is. And so for me, that was what it, it was about. And I think a lot of guys probably had a similar um, motivation. And I'm not suggesting that I, there was nothing to do with the love of my country or patriotism. Those things were, were involved. But I, if I'm honest, it was, it was my personal search. And was that search successful? Did you find yourself? Did well, you in many it? ways, yes. I mean, um, the, the gauntlet of making it through that and, and being able to serve with some of these just amazing men was a, an eye opening experience and it changed. It, it definitely, I, I look back on the kind of confidence I had in myself before that and it's light years different. Um, you know, it, it was a pinnacle moment and it's, it's affected almost everything that's happened after me, that the confidence that that gave me um, affected me, not just, 
in the military, but in leaving the military in, in the private sector and in, in starting businesses to getting involved in, into some of the anti-trafficking work as well. So it was, I can't imagine, I can't imagine that um, I would have been in the same mental state had I not taken the time to prove that to myself and, and to, I just, I don't know where I'd be, to be frank. And uh, what was, what was the thing which led you to the, develop this confidence? It, well, it was, it was, um, you know, all of the, I listened to all of the rumors about SEAL training. It's impossible. You can't do it. A lot of friends said you can't do it. It's impossible. Only X percent of people make it through. And then there was a bunch of people saying, you know, conspiracies about, oh, they actually break your leg in first phase. And then they do like, they were saying all kinds of crazy things. And, and, um, so there was all this extra stuff. Actually, I was, I, did, I went into this wondering how much of this was true. And so there were things that weren't true and there's all this illusion, but what it was for me was it was, it was a giant that I turned it into, right? A giant that everyone said you can't do. And that confidence and going to battle with, with the giant is, is what changed in me. That was, I, I realized after that, that even if people are saying it's impossible, it doesn't matter. It's just about willpower and the ability to, to uh, um, not give up when, when things get tough. And, and actually the, the real key that I learned in that moment, because it was hard and it was, there was a lot of guys that, that quit and there was a lot of guys that were questioning why they were there. And what I noticed is for me, the difference in, in my mindset was I was thinking about the future and about what would happen if I did quit, right? I was thinking about coming, laying down my head in my bed 10 years later, looking back on this moment and asking myself, why did I quit? You know, not as much because of the military or because of the country or anything like that, but because of how did I quit on myself, basically, and, and, and how that would plague me. So I guess for me, even though it was difficult, I was constantly thinking about, man, what would I be if I had to go back? Now, I'm not suggesting that anyone that quit, you know, is, is all of a sudden going to have these plaguing issues, especially people that uh, tried their best and, and, and got hurt, injured. There's a lot of those amazing guys that did that. But for me, it was one of those things where I didn't want to look back and have second guesses about, I, I can take failure if I failed or if I got injured. But for me, I couldn't take the idea of, of knowingly just giving up. So that like, so you had these moments that you thought about like, wait a minute, like this is this is really oh, yeah. challenging here. But then oh, yeah. you, you kept focusing on like, like no, that's what I want. Like, um, yeah, I, absolutely, absolutely. I was thinking uh, in my mind as, as those thoughts would come in, I would think, you know what, this is a short season of 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 pain. You know, this is a short season of pain. And I was putting much more emphasis, even during the moment, on the future and on my own um, self-identity, my own perception of myself, which I was trying to define. So I don't, think there, I don't think there is anything that they could have thrown at me during that season uh, that would have gotten me to quit. Uh, they, could have, they could have injured me or something like that. But uh, I, I was one of those moments, and I think we all have these moments in life that it's like, you're either going to do it or you're not and everything else hinges on it. And, you know, it's kind of like one moment in time affects multiple decisions after that, you know, your confidence level after you beat a giant completely changes the way you see every other opportunity after that. And so that, and that's what happened. I, I mean, I'm very thankful that my young 22 year old self, you know, was that hard headed and that, you know, that determined because it really was one of those decisions that, that very much changed the way I saw myself and in turn changed the trajectory of my life. Well, for how long, for long, how long have you been with the Navy SEALs? Well, I went in and in, in the year 2007 is when I went into the military and I got out of the military in 2013. So for six years. Were you, were you ever deployed in combat? I was, I was deployed in Iraq um, and then throughout Africa. Um, so yeah, I was, and I got to see the, um, 
I got to see the good and the bad of, of war and what, and, you know, there, you, you find, you find people doing heroic things, amazing things for the lives of their teammates. And you see that those kind of things. And you also see terrible things and war isn't pretty and um, it never is. And it is very glamorized today, but um, it's very tragic. And a lot of people, in the middle of the situation, good, honest people get caught in the middle of it. And that's, uh, so, you know, I, I, that was, you know, the, the Hollywood version of war, uh, definitely got, um, uh, destroyed <laughs> after seeing it for sure. One of the things I read today when I was researching a little bit about your background and, um, went to the page of one of the projects you're involved with, and there was this quote, from Jordan Peterson, which is a harmless man isn't a good man. A good man is a very, very dangerous man who has it under voluntary control. <laughs> and that's uh, and, yeah, and that, and Jordan Peterson, I have a lot of respect for, and that's a phenomenal quote. Um, I couldn't agree more. It's um, today we've been kind of conditioned to think, um, you know, that you know violence is in, inherently wrong or inherently bad. And, um, and in many cases it is, I, I want to be clear about this. Um, but in, in many parts of the world, um, it's the lack of violence that is perpetuating, um, systematic oppression of people. I mean, I could point to examples all over the world. I could point to Joseph Coney, who runs the Lord's resistance army and has trafficked over 80,000 children, mutilated their faces, the boys become child soldiers, the girls become sex slaves. And in many places, there's a very, the, the, the desire to stop him and the desire to do what's needed to be done hasn't been there. And, um, and, and they just keep taking children. And, um, you know, there's a, a <laughs> I understand why people can, uh, after serving in war, there, there's an argument to be made that the wars that we're getting drug into are more about money than they are about the reason and the context for which we go. I think there's a valid argument for, for some people to make there, but you can highlight certain examples in the world where um, people are being systematically oppressed and there is and, and there's zero response. There's no men standing up saying we're gonna you know we're gonna stop this and i i think i think we're gonna have to answer not just for the things we do in life but the, for the things that we don't do in life um and so under that context violence if done under the right motivation can be either the most amazing thing that is done for the sake of somebody else or in the wrong context could be the most evil thing. And so I think the problem is in the way we, we picture violence and you hear the word violence, you immediately think of something negative. Um, and so why? And I think we, I think we should um, take the time to, to consider the way m many people in the world are living. And it's the lack of violence, the lack of people stepping up to help the innocent women that are being systematically raped in Congo by the inner Hamway there's no response and people keep saying, well, we have to love our enemies. We have to, you know, and I, I think that I wonder, I wonder if people, if they put themselves in that situation where uh, systematically every year they come down into the village, they take the women, they rape them. The men don't take the women back after they've been raped. Right. <laughs> and they have rape clinics uh, all over the place because of how widespread this is now. I think that what people have to do is, you know, they, they can't just say, well, you know, we should, you know, we, we should send them more aid and we can do all these things. But the fact, I mean, I think that here's the difference. If it happened to you or happened to me or it happened to one of our wives, you know, I don't think that's the thing we would be doing, right? <laughs> if someone came in, took your, your, your uh, significant other away and, and raped them, I don't think we would be, I don't think any any good-hearted human would 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 say that um, you know let's let's just do nothing and let's get more aid. And I think they would want something to be done, not just for the vengeance factor of their loved one, 
but because it can't keep going on, it's got to stop that, that desire, I guess, for justice. And I, I think, I think that's one of the things that is missing today or that people feel like they can't say because it's aggressive or violent to, to suggest that we should, um, right wrongs or correct wrongs or stop people or even kill people. Hmm. Thank you very much for sharing this because this is something which I've been thinking about the last months, what is right, what is wrong. And, right. and the, one of the personal realizations was also that um, force like, or even violence is okay. If you're attacked, like to defend yourself yeah? and that, that, that is an inherent right to say no to oppression. And, and even in the context of anger, that was something also, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts that our society is socially engineered conditioned, um, to, uh, stigmatize anger, especially men. And, um, yeah. there's there, you might say there are two forms of anger. One is like immature and, uh, I don't know, being bothered that the, that the soccer, like soccer team, like, uh, failed or so, but then, <laughs> yeah. but then the other form of anger is, um, to, to fight oppression yeah? and, and, uh, yeah. like to stand up against wrong. Uh, and, and this is the force yeah, who gives you the energy to stand up. And, um, and um, that's on this is like a personal reflection over the last months. And so I'm really, like, like I'm really uh, what you're sharing is, is really, really interesting. And um, you seem very, very passionate about fighting human trafficking. Um, but also yeah. like, I, 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 it appears to me against injustice. Is this, something which you always cared about or was there a special situation or occasion which led to it? Well, at first, I, 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 years ago when I got started into that mission, I didn't really know very much about it when I got asked to help with a certain operation. And because of that first operation that I was involved in, and it was in Colombia, um, it, it showed me just how widespread it was. And so, um, I didn't think there was as much demand for kids um, that there is in the world. And the fact that it's growing so fast was hard for me to, to digest. And um, it left me kind of just the same, the same things that I'd seen in other countries, you know, this, this horrible problem of oppression, whether that be of women or, um, of, you know, people creating, you know, slave armies of kids. Uh, now seeing this demand uh, and this growing demand for, for young kids for, for, for sex was just, you know, kind of makes you, it, I, I can, I can see how some people probably don't want to look at it or, or they, 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 they want to maybe shrug it off as conspiratorial um, because for all of us, I think we're all dealing with this like awakening that's happening in the world, you know, where we're starting to see that the institutions, our governments, um, maybe for some people, their religious institutions, um, aren't always giving us all the truth. And people are starting to have the ability to check for themselves and to get information by multiple different sources, um, not just the, the mainstream uh, sources that are out there. And it's causing this great divide where people are starting to question long held beliefs. Um, interesting. It, it, and this is, this is kind of where I've been and, and this anti-trafficking issue was right at the heart of it for me. I mean, I, you know, seeing that there, there are powerful institutions that protect these, these horrible uh, sins and protect the people that do that. Um, and it's, it's a very troubling thing. And I, I think, the problem when it comes to pedophilia is that everyone thinks that it's happening somewhere else. That's if I could say that the consistent theme that I've seen in working to combat this issue is everyone thinks it's happening in this country or that country or Thailand or there. And it is happening there, but the point is it's happening everywhere. And there are people in our own neighborhoods and our own networks that are, you know, have an attraction to kids. And there's a, there's also attempts to try to normalize this, um, uh, in some, in some media outlets as well. Um, and then there's 
sometimes there's organizations, whether they be religious organizations, that are trying to hide this because it, it reflects poorly on the religion. So now there's massive legal teams covering for people that do these things. And so um, it's, it's just, uh, it's very sad. It makes us all kind of, some, for some people, when they question these institutions, whether they be religion, government, any of these things, they find themselves in free fall because it's like, where's truth? What, how do I, the truth that I thought was there maybe isn't. So they're looking for a branch to grab onto. And I think what people have to do is just get used to free fall and learn to enjoy the free fall because in the free fall of, of when, once we finally give up and stop holding on to all the things that we're defining as our exclusive institutions of truth, it pushes us to start using our own logic, our own thinking, our own, <laughs> our own um, conscience. And that is where we all should have been already. <laughs> but, we, you know, we're, we're human and we're all affected by the society we grew up in. So I think we're, 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 even though it's scary, and even though a lot of people are, um, some people are holding on and trying to avoid uh, um, maybe going down this line of thinking like you and I are talking about. But I would encourage everyone, even though it does start with a free fall, everyone that, everyone that jumps out of an airplane is terrified when they first jump, but then they like it. And and once once you don't have a horse in the race and you're not saying, well, I believe this institution or that one or this media narrative, once you have no one to defend, you can actually listen to information in a relatively unbiased way and have your own opinion. And I think uh, this is the exciting thing, I think, about 2020. Um, it started with, you know, Epstein and the obvious the obvious problems that happened with uh, Jeffrey Epstein. And a lot of people before Epstein said that there wasn't pedophilia happening at high levels. And anyone who said that was deemed a conspiracy theorist. And I think, I think the Epstein case was a very obvious one uh, that a lot of people are knowing that there's more things going on there than what have been said. And the year just kept going, right? COVID <laughs> started and then, I think there's some people that are starting to think there's more going on than just the virus, right? Um, there's other issues at stake. There's civil liberties at stake. There's um, universal um, controls that are being set up and there's people concerned about that and the effect it's gonna have on society and small businesses and in our lives. And people are starting to ask questions about that. And it, But again, it's putting us into this free fall of where is truth and I think the good thing is there is no, you know, there really is no media network that has truth. There's no, there's no way to find the source. There's no source that owns truth. Truth exists everywhere. If you can, if you have the ability to look objectively at it. And I think we're, I think as a society, we're starting to see a shift in people that are starting to ask these questions. And um, I think it's exciting. I think this, even though it's troubling, even though it's, even though it's a rocky year, and I think the next years are going to be more rocky, um, I think it's good. I think it's good for us all to be shaken. Yeah, it's a, it's a shaky, shaky year. And, <laughs> I, I, and, and I, I'm really, like, I would love to, for those who are listening to this conversation, if you could explain possibly the bigger pit, picture of pedophilia and um Depending on the sources, I read that there are a couple of like several million children currently being sex sla slaves on this planet. And th that's just like a mind blowing number. But, but then if you're just like reading the daily newspapers or that this is not something you, you really um, find talked about. And like you have been dedicating quite some time and energy and uh, you've been part on. <laughs> missions if, if, like to, to, to save those children. So I would love to, if, you, if you could explain a little bit what's the problem, um, that there is possibly an industry behind it, which is like incredibly huge. And if you, if you could share a little bit more about that. Sure, would, yeah. So. Well, there are, there's, there's definitely, um, there's a few ways that pedophilia 
gets protected and gets utilized by institutions and and and, and I mean, we can we can see the obvious cases. I think a glaring example for a religious institution, and not to offend any Catholics, I know there's many good Catholics out there in the world, um, but there has been a a number of cases of child molestation and pedophilia within church. Now, the problem that is happening, and I think you know, this is one of those cases where it's easier to see if if you're not a Catholic it's probably easier to, to digest this information and go, oh, of course there's an issue in the Catholic Church. If you are Catholic, you're probably gonna go, well, wait, are you sure? And therein lies the problem where we are beholden to institutions that we believe have to be you know, benevolent. Um, and if there is a, a narrative that's contradictory to that, even if it's hurting children, many times we, we, we get quiet and we stop looking right for the truth because we care more about the institution being val being validated right so it's not a crazy it, this isn't like a, a crazy conspiracy but there is a pattern of um you know suppressing uh voices um and and um defending priests that are obviously uh committing these 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 pro these issues and it's a very widespread problem um some people speculate that the origins, and this is not just the Catholic Church, by the way, this is almost every mainstream religion has uh, this going on in some way. And it, 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 if you go to Afghanistan, you have the dancing boys in Afghanistan where the tribal elders have dress up little boys and put you know, mascara on them and have them dance around in dresses and they rape them. Um, it's so I'm not trying to say this is a Christian thing, a Muslim thing, a Jewish thing, but institutions have developed this track record of defending and trying to suppress and hide this information, of course, because it, it destroys, it potentially can destroy the institution. So now you have this massive legal structure centered on going against the uh, the people that are raising their voices against this and not for them. This is one example of how the how this institutional, I guess, form of 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 defense for for pedophilia exists. Does that make sense? It's not. Some people some people think that you know it. I've heard people. There's all kinds of movements going on right now that are. A little bit fringe and they have everyone you know they, they focus more on there's this elite pedophile network running around and there are people in elite networks um doing this but the way that they're making the argument is kind of making it more hokey than and more you know kind of illogical i'll give you an example for epstein there was uh, most of the evidence points to what was happening on epstein's island was connected to an intelligence operation where there were bringing politicians there and, and, and filming them having sex with young girls in order to get compromising material on them so that they could actually control those politicians. So that's, that's how one could use uh, pedophilia for an intelligence program in, in order to own different politicians. And that's a very um, clever, sinister, dark uh, way of doing it, but also very effective. There's one thing in politics that you can't come back from and it's you know verified reports of you having sex with a minor um so and then there's you know even within these issues there's there's real issues there's conspiracy ones and there's conspiracies that are true and there's conspiracies that are not true and i think it's important that even if there are far-reaching conspiracies out there um and even if they are proven to be not true, it doesn't mean there aren't others that are true. And I think that's the hard part we're all in as humans. We're trying to figure out which one of these things has merit and which one of these things doesn't. But I think it's important for people to look at um, very, um, you know, anyone that researches like what I'm talking about when it comes to religions, particularly the Catholic Church in this case, will be able to find all of these cases. Uh, very easily and see that there is a systematic problem there and that there also is a massive legal team that is very well funded um, that continues to um, suppress this. So that's a, a very easy example for people to digest, I think.
Thank you very much for, for, for talking about this. And you have been part of like a rescue team or like a mission team, which actually went into locations to save children, which been held yeah. in slavery. And, uh, and can, can, can you talk us through such a, such a like, mission to, I mean, like for me personally, like to give some context, when I when I heard, heard about like whatever pedophilia or it's not like that before, it was like mm, whatever, like this is somewhere else. This is like there is no relevance. It's yeah. not like anyway, I cannot do anything. And uh, it's it's um, and but then also the the more I read about it, and that's also why I'm curious to hear your firsthand experience because that makes it like <laughs> tangible and like wait a minute like uh, this is a really a common thing and um and, like, hopefully creates more awareness about this sure yeah well I mean, even currently there, i mean there's multiple people that what we're finding is people that get addicted to to black market child porn typically uh this there's a very common trend with people that people that get into child porn end up de developing a need for for real uh kids right instead of just the porn eventually they want to do the real thing and um this happens in the u.s a lot uh, most people that are actually abused are abused by someone very close to them or by a family member so sometimes when we talk about trafficking we get in, we, we kind of confuse things a little bit because just a, a kid doesn't need to be taken from somebody and sent somebody else for them to be a sex slave that And, uh, mm -hmm. and I think sometimes in people's minds, if they're not in a cage being sent somewhere, they're not a, they're, they're not a sex slave. And so, and so the, we're looking at it kind of through, you know, the member the movie taken where the girl's taken away and then he has to go hunt her down somewhere there. I think, I think that's getting a little bit overhyped and people are kind of conflating human trafficking, which is largely about labor trafficking. Okay. And they're connected. They are connected. I'll give you an example of that. Mm -hmm. But sex, sex trafficking, and even within sex trafficking, is is the sex slavery issue where pedophiles are exploiting young people, either whether they're family members or whether they're close to a family. This is happening all over the world. But what happens uh, for some Americans in our in our country, we have people that think it's easier to abuse kids in other countries. So they go to places where they think there's easier access to children and they do that there. And many times I've, I've gone after many of these guys that have set up nonprofits. They've set up um, uh, ministries in other countries, ministries in other countries, you know, in many cases. And they do that because any ministry typically has easy access to children because that's one of the things you do first is you, you start helping the kids and, in having Bible studies and things like that. Um, and this isn't to suggest that, you know, this is, this is not to diminish again, the role of, of people doing good work through their religions and good work through, through ministries. I'm not suggesting that uh, this is, this shouldn't taint that. These are, these are people using religion for purposes, but it is happening. It's happening all over. Um, and what we try to do is, We, we figure out ways of, of kind of tracking these people and developing relationships so that we can actually develop cases that prosecute these guys. And, and we do that in conjunction with law enforcement and with the host countries that these guys go to. And it, it, to, in order to do that, it takes a lot of relationship building. You have to be in a country. You have to have trusted people on the ground that you can, that you can use as, as, as your, you know, as the, the operators that are going to actually go. We don't, have, we don't have some jurisdiction to go run around in another country doing their job for them. So it's always done in conjunction with their law enforcement. Um, and that's always a sticky one too, right? Law enforcement sometimes can be in on it or paid off depending on the country you go to. So you got to be careful. One of the things we do in order to kind of verify and vet law enforcement is we do a lot of training and we provide tactical training and all kinds of training. But the main reason why we do it is so that we can get to know who we're working with down there and kind of uh, put them through a vetting process. And so once we have that trust developed, um, and we have the other intelligence components set up where we know where the bad guys are. 
that's the key is making sure we have trusted trusted officials in law enforcement and in the legal process and then we have um, a good intelligence uh, that we can execute on and we we do that multiple different ways we have uh, intelligence networks that give us information we have and most of those are local networks of people um, we like to do things as much as we can um, through that through through uh, partners in the country um, when it comes to these things we'd rather not you know it not be you know it, it's not about having an American movement in some other country it's we're trying to find alignment with the people in each country that want to see this problem stopped that's what we do we align with the people that already exist in those countries that are already really fighting it <laughs> And we're, we're coming to bring extra tools, resources, and, and equipment. So that's kind, of a, that's kind of a snapshot. It's kind of like, it's kind of similar to the Green Berets. The Green Beret mission is very much to go into other countries, build up local forces, and then help them uh, go, go fight your battles. And that's kind of what, what we do. That's a, kind of a, a brief snapshot. Then do, do you also go then to pretend to be a customer and like uh, set up something to then like um, catch the perpetrators um, like in the action yeah. or something like that? Or how, how can I imagine that? that? We, we have done that multiple times uh, successfully. Um, we have to be careful on each country's laws. Um, mm -hmm. For some countries that can be, that can be deemed entrapment. Um, so, And, and for some countries, it's not the right, it isn't the right approach. Um, and for some countries, it can be utilized. We just have to be very careful on the, on the methods we use for each country. And so, um, but that has been a successful one as well. Um, we've uncovered everything from not just trafficking uh, um, across borders. Most of the trafficking is for labor. Um, and, and a good example of that, and most Americans uh, are very aware of, the border issue in America that has been discussed politically. And there is a trafficking uh, connection to that. Obviously, uh, the, the bulk of the trafficking is happening by Latinos that want to come to the country. So it's, it's not like they're being held in cages to you know, be shipped somewhere. It's kind of willful trafficking, if you will, where there's people pushing people across the borders. And, and in many ways, they want to be there. And many corporations in America want them to come here so that they can drive wage prices down. And this is not unique to the United States, by the way. Every country, almost every country does this kind of tactic. So they, they, they want a, a cheaper labor force, right? So they lure them to come across the border. And, and that's, that's the problem is they want there to be the, they would prefer them to be illegals so that they can charge them whatever they want to charge them if they were legal citizens coming across the border legally then uh, it would be more difficult to do so. But here's where I'm getting at is where the, where the sex trafficking fits into that is once these, once these people that are moving people across borders for labor, once they realize there's a certain demand for children and they know how to get people across the border, then children start getting smuggled in there as well. That, so there are connected issues, um, sex trafficking and human trafficking, and they affect each other because The rat lines, if you want to call them that, uh, the, the arteries that people are moved across borders are the same arteries that someone would send a child across the border um, um, for a certain reason. So they do need to be dealt with eventually. Um, I know this is very political. Um, it's become a very, you know, especially if you live in the U.S., it's a very political issue. But we, I think we, we need to get to the heart of it and have a more common sense discussion that isn't as, isn't as much about... Um, you know, political narrative, narrative as much as it is about, you know, common sense. And other countries, I think, should be having this discussion as well. One of the things you said before that the problem is increasing, that, like, is it that uh, pedophilia, child prostitution is actually increasing, that it is growing? It is, it is increasing. Um, and there, there's people that have different views on why it's increasing. Um, It's hard, it's hard for me to pinpoint one reason as to why. Uh, some people think it's the, the boom in, in, in pornography, which has opened the door for more black market pornography and other things uh, that, that kind of lead people to this path of wanting something a little more crazy, you know, in what they view. Um, someone make the argument that, you know, the way 
pornography is categorized, it normalizes, it normalizes kind of crazier and crazier ideas. So when you click on something, you feel like, well, everyone else is doing it too. Um, and, you know, barely legal, uh, you know, and then eventually, you know, so there's this argument that there's people kind of going down the slope of you know, one category to another. It's hard to say why some people don't go down that slope. They just look at normal stuff and, and that's all they look at. And another person will go down this path that, you know, they eventually um, start to look at things that are just atrocious and, and uh, develop a, a need for it. And so there's some that think that that's a pivotal part of what's where the rise is coming from. I, I kind of think that it's mostly, I think the, the, I guess the, the institutions doing the most protection of innocent, uh, most uh, protection of this issue, trying to defend people from looking into it are, you know, large, large, large religious organizations are, are some of the top, uh, at creating that shield because it's such a damning thing to, to the religion. And so it's the more attacks against it, the more the legal team grows, the more attacks, you know, it's, it's kind of this thing. And then, you know, of course, people within that organization are going to defend it. People outside are going to use that. It, it's funny though, it's happening in other religions too. So most of the time you'll have people in another religion criticizing the Catholic religion and not knowing that it's going on in theirs as well. <laughs> so it's like everyone can see the problem in each other, uh, mm -hmm. but few, few lesser, lesser people are, are willing to see the problem in their own. And I think, um, I think that's what we need is we need a movement of people inside all of these amazing religions that are willing to tell the truth and do it in the name of the religion. Like any, any good hearted Catholic or any good hearted, uh, Christian, evangelical, whoever it is, uh, Jewish people, everyone should be wanting to rid this out of their organizations. And, and I don't think the right tactic is to defend it or to create a safe place for it. Um, I think the, I think there needs to be a movement in all these great faiths of, of calling it out and uprooting it. Hmm. And one of the things I also wanted to ask you from what I know, the organizations or some of them like, which you have been working or still are working with, there are nonprofits. They're living from donations. Is that correct? Or like, it's it's yeah. privately funded. What 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 like? Yeah. What you're going after? That's yeah. It's privately that's, funded. Mm -hmm. Um, like um, what we do now is all the all the guys now at Covenant Rescue. All of our guys are former special operations guys, uh, law enforcement. And all of our guys do it on a volunteer basis. So well, they have their jobs that they do and they do their job. And then in their off time, they come and do this work and they give their time. So that way, that way all the money that comes in just goes straight to the operations. And um, that's kind of what we've set up. And I mean, we want to make sure that people have good visibility on where their money is going and, and how it's being utilized because there is a lot of problems in the nonprofit space. I'm, who's allocating what funding to what mm -hmm. issues. So that's, I think that's the name of the game for us is making sure there's transparency. The, yeah, that's, that's very noble. Um, and I mean, I hear you talking is so passionate about these things and um, I'm really curious, like what's your driving force? Like what, what, what drives you? You know, um, I was the kid um, you know, there's two types of kids in a family. If, if there's a problem in the home and there's, and there's this issue, there's one kind of kid that wants to cover it up and protect the family. Mm -hmm. And then you got the loud kid that's trying to get everyone's attention. Hey, th there's something wrong. Right. And I think I'm the second kid. Right. <laughs> so I, I've been, I've lived enough and seen enough of the world. I've seen enough of uh, the wars being fought, the agendas being driven by governments and kind of, I guess the darker side to that as well to go. A lot of the things that people believe about their governments, it just isn't true. And a lot of the pretexts that have been set up in our minds to engage in these never ending wars is not true as well. Um, and that was a hard thing for me to digest because I was a part of those wars. Um, well, was it something? Was it something you realized while still being in the military or was it after? Yes, or was I it did. the reason yeah. that you left? It, it, was, it was what I realized in the military and one of the driving reasons I left. Um, and was there one moment? So I, or? 
It was a series of events, uh, a series of moments that made me start asking questions. And, and when you're in the military, asking questions isn't always the best, you know, <laughs> uh, philosophy. You know, soldiers need to be able to, you know, obey orders. And um, there's that mindset within the military. And there's a lot of guys, there's a lot of other guys that are, would, would verify what I'm saying that know that there's, and I'm not suggesting at all that this means that the guys in the military are the problem. Um, most guys join the military because they want to help their country. They want to serve. They want to, they want to help others and they want to make an impact in the world. So um, the same, you know, and I, I think the, tr the same is true for, for most law enforcement um, around the world. They want to, they want to do, do good. Um, but a lot of, you know, it's not the warriors or the soldiers or the cops that make, that are making the decisions on what they're being asked to do. And therein lies the problem is a lot of what's being asked to do um, is, is uh, more to benefit big industries uh, and less to do with uh, whatever the narrative is coming out of that particular government. So for me, seeing, seeing the way the game, I guess, is really played, uh, starting to kind of ask more questions about why these wars are so unending and why they've been set up to be wars that never end. Um, and there's, there's, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, so this, this anti-trafficking mission and this, you know, this war on pedophiles became a focal point for me because I was kind of in free fall after learning all of that. And now it's like, well, what do I do? I've been trying to do all this stuff. And so when I found this, this mission, it was a no brainer. It was, and now thankfully we have this massive network of people in, in many different countries and we're all aligned. Even if we have different faiths, different beliefs, different governments that we, you know, different political affiliations, we have all these things are different, but we all agree on one thing and it's helping these kids and stopping pedophiles. So it's really interesting. It's like now we're kind of building this army and, and it's not an army that has any national borders. It's just the people that all believe that we can all agree on one thing, you know, and that it's, we're going to stop this, you know? So I think that's very powerful. I think, um, I think what's happening in the world right now is awakening more people to this reality. And I think uh, we're only going to grow because of it. Thank you very much. And I mean, I know you're very outspoken and um, you, you, you say what you think. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm also curious to hear, like, do you have a set of values you live by? Or like, um, is, there, is there something you, you, you set yourself up as a, like, I don't know, a moral code or something you, you're kind of like holding yourself yeah. accountable to? Or like, what, yes. what's, what's grounding you? Yeah, I, I grew up with religion in my life. I grew up with uh, a lot of uh, Christian logic. Both of my parents were ministers. Um, I found out later that I had this kind of Jewish background as well that's a little more obscure in my family. Uh, so for years, I kind of straddled the fence between the, the religion I was raised with growing up, Christianity. Judaism also has played a big role in my life, and I studied at synagogue and learned the Torah as well. And so I have, I've learned to appreciate um, that there's truth in a lot of, I think a lot of different people, regardless of whether they have the same persuasion as, as me, uh, there's, there's truth in, in all parts of the world. And, um, I've learned to look for that truth in all parts of the world. Um, so my code is, is, you know, it's definitely, um, it's definitely changed because growing up, I would have been the religious person that said, you know, you know, if you have to, in order, in order to be, you know, in God's uh, grace, you need to be part of this religion in some way or so, something like that, which I think most religions uh, perpetuate some idea like that. You need to be plugged in. You need to be part of the religion in order to be in God's favor. I would say now that the one thing I do hold on to is that there is, I do believe there's a true being in, up there that is good. And I believe he's judging all of us fairly and he's judging all of us based off of our actions and the intentions behind our actions. So not just actions, but why we did what we did. And I think that judgment transcends all religions. I think it transcends all points of view. So um, I, don't, I don't believe for a second that because of my personal feelings about the Bible or the Torah, that that sets me apart from somebody in China that doesn't have that knowledge. I think we're all judged based off what we know um, so if one person has more truth, I think they're going to be more accountable to that truth. If another person knows less truth, 
they're going to be accountable to that level that they understand. So I believe in fairness and I believe there is a good being up there. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if any of the major religions represent that being uh, exclusively. Um, I don't believe that. Now, I know many people would say, uh, would, would disagree with me there, but I would, I would suggest that uh, most of the institutions have very little to do with that being um, that is up there. And we're all trying to piece together uh, the truth. <laughs> you know, we're all trying to find this being, but I don't think he's actually waiting for us to find the truth in terms of, well, it's really the Christian God. It's really the Jewish God. Oh, it's really the Islam. I don't think he's trying to get us to find that. I think he wants us just to learn to be honest with each other as humans, honest with him. I think he wants us to ask him honest questions when we're alone in our private time and not just go through a religious ritual, not just go hang out with the, the, the friends and people that think alike. I think he wants us to be sincere and honest. And I think that's what uh, he's looking at and looking for. Another thing I'm really curious, um, you must have been experiencing quite a couple of challenging or even um, frightening situations. And um, <clears throat> um, I, well, for example, when you go on these missions, is there still like a sense of danger or uncertainty? Like can something like uh, yeah. go wrong? And is there like, is there a sense of fear within you, which like, still or are you so used adapted to these situations that, that like, it is not present anymore or how, how can i imagine it because i don't have I, like i'm just thinking about these situations and um yeah i don't think it's as big of an issue anymore um you know there's something to be said about when when you know you're doing what is right you make peace with the fact that even if things do go wrong, I would be more than happy to die doing what I know 100% is right. There is the, there is the thrill of, you know, when you're going through the operation, of course, of planning and everything and still going through all of those, those steps to make sure that it's successful. And there's a, there's an adrenaline uh, part to that, that sometimes blocks out some of the fear. Um, there always is in the back of your head, there's normal fears because you always want to, you know, you think about your family, your own kids of wanting to be able to go back to them as well. There's that, that that's a very real thing that pops into my head uh, when we're doing missions. Um, but oh, the overall feeling, and I think even my family would, you know, as, as heartbreaking as it would be if, if, if I did go, you know, if they did lose me, um, I think. I think they would all know why I did what I did and, and that it was for the right reason. So I'm not at all worried. I think, I, I just think life is so short anyway, regardless of whether it looks like a big difference between dying at the age of 37 and dying at the age of 70, it's not a, or 80, you know, or 90, it's not a big difference. I, I think it's all about how we live, whatever this short amount of time is we have. And, and when you get into that mindset, it really frees you. Mm. It really, it really is like all the fear and you stop making decisions based off fear and you just do what you want to do in life and do it to, to the best of your ability. And, and you do it and hopefully we're doing things that are going to be better for humanity and better for each other. And so I think, I think that, you know, on the other side of all that fear, you know, there's this really liberating place. Once you, once you come to grips, it's not that I don't think I can die. I 100% am aware that I'm not bulletproof and that I could easily die uh, doing this kind of work, but it's fine. I mean, I don't care. I, I'm not afraid of death anymore. And I think, I think many people can get to that place, but I don't think you can get there unless you have a deep personal connection with your purpose and why you're here. I don't think you can just get there if you think, well, you know, um, this is my business path and this is this and this is this. You have your life all mapped out. I'm going to do this, this, and this and retire this. Day. I don't think it's just about that. I think it's having a deep knowing that what you're doing is right and that it's better for, for others as well, better for humanity, better for this world. And I, I do believe that we have uh, humans, all of us, we have a calling in this world to uphold 
truth, justice, and to be a part of that process. Where some people would say, well, that's God's job to control the world. I would say, I would say uh, my view of this is that God would be saying to us, it is your job to do. So as humans, we, sometimes many humans, when we see the evil that's happening in the world, we say, God, how could you let this happen? I think God is literally saying that to us. Uh, I think God put us in charge of this planet. And I think we have to be accountable for the good and the evil that happens on it. Resonates very much with us that, uh, uh, that it's, yeah, otherwise it's just an excuse to not change anything. Yeah. And um, I mean, why would we have our potential if we would not like be required to use it? That's, that's one of the, is this, is this something also you are passing on because I know you are, for example, training SWAT teams, but you're also organizing workshops. Is, is this something of the message <laughs> you're um, transporting yeah. or educating? I others try in? to, yeah, I try to keep the message, you know, even when I teach tactics, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, most of, most of the tactics that we learn in the military, it's a very simple concept. When you go into a house and you go into a room and you're going in there to fight, The best tactics are when you can have a mul multiple people defending each other, right? And so you go in with your partner, and if you focus on defending your partner, you'll do our tactics almost, the tactics will fall in line. Does that make sense? But if you start thinking about yourself and how you're going to protect yourself, the tactics fall apart. So I, I think there's a really uh, beautiful lesson in the way we do advanced uh, tactics for SWAT teams or for law enforcement. Um, there's a real selfless component to that. And I think, I think there's a trick that people can play with themselves. And sometimes, uh, sometimes one way of tricking yourself out of fear, like if you were, if, you know, if you're about to go into a dangerous situation and all you're thinking about is, Oh my gosh, what am I going to do? How am I going to, how am I going to stay alive? Oh my gosh. If you push off those thoughts with a different thought and you start thinking, you know, how am I going to keep Simon alive? How am I going to help him through this process? And it puts you into a much different state and it changes and it makes you much more calm, much more, um, you know, alert in your decision-making and it gets you off of yourself. And I think there's a bigger lesson in that, that, it, that all of us can, can glean from whether they're, you know, in a business or on an executive team or it's when we, you know, I think, I think Gandhi said it best. It's um, what's that famous thing is the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. And sometimes, it, you know, I guess the, the narrative I'm trying to bring out of this is, Sometimes in life, we get so focused with ourselves. And it, let's just say for business, we have our business goals. We want to get there. We know where, our, we know where we're heading. Here's our true north. We're, we're going to work as hard as we can to get there. But sometimes when we, when we overly focus on our goal, we start to let stress in. We start to put extra pressure on ourselves to get to that goal. And all of a sudden, the very goal that we set out to, to which, which at first looked like this amazing goal, now it seems like a prison. Right. And I think the best way for anyone to change this perception and to change their, their mental state is don't is take a moment every day, not even to look at your goal, put your goal aside and concentrate for at least an hour a day on helping those around you, whether that's helping a friend with a business connection. Maybe you have a, a connection that you could be helping someone with, but you're, you're so focused on your own goal, or I am, that I'm stuck in this place of, I can't get there. And I think there's a trick that we can play where, and we don't need to do this for our own gain. We should do it for sincere reasons. You know, hey, I just need to take a second, step back and start looking at how can I help those around me? That includes our family. Maybe we can help our, our significant other. Maybe we need to get away. Uh, and just be alone for, with someone for a while. Maybe we need to help someone uh, that's in a financial situation that, that is down. You know, whatever that, that is, I think if we take the time to be deliberate about that, then it puts, the moment you do that, you find that you, whatever that thing is that was causing stress, that overly focused stress, it goes away. And all of a sudden, I, I noticed that all of a sudden little things start happening where you end up getting to that goal 
and you find other people coming to you to help and coming to you uh, for assistance in areas that you couldn't have done. So I, I think for me, this is, this is how I try to snap myself out of that feeling of stress to the feeling that the weight of the world is, is, is on, on my shoulders. Anytime I feel that, I, I take a step back and I start to realize that I have, I've made some mistakes that I've, <laughs> I'm, I'm overly focusing. I'm overly, I'm overly putting my goals at too high of a priority where they've surpassed all of the needs of the people around me. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, makes perfect sense. Yeah. That's... <laughs> and I, I, I think it, anyone, I think anyone can try this. They try it today. Try it, anyone out there listening. Try it today. Stop thinking about what you're trying to do in life and what your goals are, you know, they're important to have, but overly focusing on them, um, that, and to a point that creates stress will, will, um, leave us uh, stagnant. will leave us, mm -hmm. will rob our spirituality. will rob our, our intentions, which is, you know, most of us, when we wake up, we want to help others. So it's that sometimes the goal is stealing us, uh, from our true mission of the day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And the mission is not just to have our goal or have our success. It's, it's to help those around us. And I do believe if people do that, they'll actually have a quicker pathway to that goal that they wanted to get to anyway. Something to think about. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, that's... <laughs> <on me now. laughs> no, no, no. It's uh, very good. Thank you very much for sharing this. And, as, uh, because you also mentioned at the beginning that, that, that you were describing what's happening this year, a bit of um, an awakening or a global awakening. And um, that's something I yeah. would love to, to hear your view a little bit more. Because I mentioned it before, you're very outspoken and um, you speak about controversial topics and maybe also some things which you don't necessarily read um, in, in, in sure. mainstream uh, papers or so. And um, we'd love to... To, like to, to explore this a bit more because maybe for some listeners but also like if i look at my family or so they they are used to certain like whatever like mainstream information and then like if something yeah. comes which doesn't fit it it's it's like ignored or it's like it's deemed like improbable and and um like i'm curious to to hear your view and um on that situation and um also how you maybe suggest or uh, like, <laughs> Like because also you mentioned truth a couple of times. Like how how can we yeah. find truth? What what is truth and what what's going on in the world right now? Yeah, that's man. This is a this is a big one. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, <know. laughs> I, I was well. I mean, when when you know, just to cut, just to jump right in there on this one. I mean, when 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 COVID started, um, I was very outspoken, and this was in the early days when uh, we were seeing pictures coming out of Wuhan that were very troubling, people lying dead in the streets and shaking, um, people in full hazmat body suits. Those were the images that we were seeing. And then, and then shortly after we saw the images, similar images coming out of Italy and, and it began uh, this, this kind of narrative um, that there was a, um, you know, the, many, many, many millions of people were going to die was the idea. Um, that idea stemmed from the Imperial College report by a guy named Neil Ferguson out of the UK. I'm very familiar with uh, that in, in the, the information presented there. So I started to look into these things. And of course, I'm already a person that questions institutions <laughs> already. And I just, like, from the beginning, I start to see a very strong, strange timing to the release of this. And I'm looking at the political situation. Of course, the U.S. is in a trade war with the Chinese. There's all this back and forth. There's the rise of Trump's nationalism and populism, which was defeating in many ways globalism and, and uh, some of the agendas of more of the Chinese and, and not just the Chinese, but other, other uh, people as well and many people in our own government as well. So you have this big war going on between ideas. And one, one idea is do we connect the world on one system and have international laws that take precedence over national laws? Or do we have this rise in populism nationalism, which basically reasserts the, the sovereignty of individual nations and their rights to maintain their autonomy? Okay, so there's these two worldviews and, and 
the nationalists would say um, decentralizing power is is going to be better for us in the long run because the more we centralize power the more we give a, a smaller group of leaders the ability to control more people which i think makes sense um of course um someone championing international concepts and globalist concepts would suggest this would be their argument that well we're all fighting over natural resources we're all fighting over these things that if we were all connected on the same sheet of music then we wouldn't need to fight over oil, over energy, over these things, and we could eliminate a lot of these wars. That would be, those are, I think, I'm summarizing, but those are, I think, the two competing worldviews that are at, at war right now. And of course, this virus pops up. Um, and the problem that I think most people had in the early days is the media was, you know, projecting yeah, uh, those those numbers I was telling you about the Imperial College report: millions were supposed to die in the UK, multiple millions are supposed to die in the US. And I was, you know, I had the I had the luxury of having friends in government at the State Department and people in Wuhan as well um, that were giving me information. Um, I also had the luxury of knowing many world-renowned epidemiologists, uh, people that are biostaticians that are experts, leading experts in the world in this field. Um, and I started to notice that a number of images started to be shaped before us. And most of us at the time believed they were by medical experts, right? And, and there was medical experts involved, but I want to be clear. Let me give you an example. In the United States, we have a coronavirus task force team, right? Headed by Dr. Fauci. Uh, and there's Dr. Burks, there is a number there, even Ben Carson uh, is on there as well. There's a number of people on that task force, but there isn't any epidemiologists. And I find that interesting. No one with experience in dealing with respiratory diseases. I also find that they're very interesting. And, and all of the people like Burks and Fauci were in HIV research, okay, but not in respiratory. And it seems like the, the narrative that was coming out of, you know, the experts, at least in our country, looked like we were trying to fight this the way we would fight HIV with quarantines and keep it centrally located and, and lockdowns. And all of the epidemiologists I knew, especially the ones that were independent from government funding, here's the big kicker. This is where science becomes controlled or scientific thought can become controlled mm -hmm. when you're weighing when you're weighing this information and you're looking at what's true and what's not not only do you have to look for experts but you have to look for who owns the experts and let me give you an example nih funds almost all of the research for most epidemiologists in the united states if I were an epidemiologist in the United States getting my funding from NIH for all of my research, would I be unbiased or would I be potentially worried about my funding stopping if I say what I really want to say? Right? <laughs> so everyone needs to realize that money, money can affect experts. And we need to kind of, it not, not suggest, I'm not suggesting that just because someone has a contrary belief to me, that they're being funded. I'm not saying that that's wrong to assume that everyone is, is paid off, but I think we need to factor that into our equation when we're listening uh, to these resources. So most of the people that I talked to, I found people that were outside of NIH that had their own funding privately. And I would, I'll, I'll reference one of them is, is Professor Knut Wachowski, who I've gotten to know and I have great respect for. He was one of the world's leading epidemiologists in the world, the head of biostatistics for the Rockefeller Center for 20 years. He is a legend in this world of, of controlling respiratory epidemics. And he said from the beginning, early on, that the only way to stop a respiratory disease, it, there is no way, there's no way to stop a respiratory disease, it's impossible. The only thing you can do is help protect the elderly and the most vulnerable during, as the virus is spreading, which is usually a four to six week period. So he was arguing that herd immunity uh, was the only way 
to, to, to get there. And it was a goal. The herd immunity is a goal that we need to have in our mindset, whether that's natural immunity from the virus or whether that's aided by a vaccine. The point is to get to herd immunity so that we can now go around the elderly and be around the elderly again and not be, uh, not cause them to, to, to be victims. So he was arguing that from the beginning, the only thing we can do is we can help nursing home facilities, assisted living facilities, but for the majority of people, we need to keep living normally. We need to keep going to restaurants. We need to live because it's better for those that have those comorbidities. And here's his argument. What he said, if we don't do that, we're gonna see multiple waves after this because we didn't allow herd immunity to set in. So then I talked to my friends early on at the State Department about what's going on in Wuhan. And they said, I was hearing that the numbers of Wuhan's infection was over 70% of the people of Wuhan, which was telling me, and this was early, this is in February, the numbers were there, which told me that herd immunity is what caused the virus to go away in Wuhan. And what the, what the media was projecting, though, is that, oh, the lockdown in Wuhan is what saved China and all this stuff. And that narrative has been playing out. But what most people don't know is, and, and for, for the first weeks in Wuhan, for the first like four to five weeks, Wuhan was cut off, but people inside Wuhan lived normally. They lived and, and mixed around and they lived normally. So the image, the narrative that we're seeing form in these countries is that we're imposing these very draconian laws that are destroying our businesses destroying people's lives, destroying their incomes, mass suicide rates, you know, or suicide is going up everywhere. And there's a direct correlation between um, bankruptcies and, and, uh, and to suicide. So, and then there's a lot of people that have real issues that weren't being treated because they didn't want to go to a hospital and get infected with COVID. There's oh, tons of outlying issues. None of these issues, but see, none of these issues are being addressed the same way the media is addressing COVID. And with COVID, you have this constant tracker of how many people are dying and how many people are this. And so this running scare tactic um, is, is, I think, um, going to cause way, way more harm than good. And just for, for some of your viewers, uh, you know, for a few facts on this, um, in America, the CDC, um, on their own website, says very bluntly that um, 6% of the deaths in America, I repeat, 6% of the deaths in America were due to only COVID, and that 94% had two to three serious comorbidities, other causes of death, where could it have been COVID that caused the death? It could have. Could it have been the existing disease? It could have been as well there. We don't know. People need to take these things into account. The World Health Organization recently released their new IFR mortality rate, and it's 0.27 right now. That's the World Health Organization. Um, you can find that. You can. It, it's it's public information. Everyone thought it would be. What is it? I think they were saying 3.14 or something. Something really insane. But they knew, we knew, I mean, we knew that it wasn't. We knew the asymptomatic cases would be so high. And so what I think people need to do is they need to look at science. Now that we have actual numbers and we have real science, we know that it's not gonna kill millions. We know that it's not gonna do what Neil Ferguson said in the Imperial College Report out of the UK. We know that now. So the problem for us as humans is that we have this nostalgic effect when people scare us, and because we were first introduced to COVID with this, it's gonna kill everyone fear, it's difficult for us to undo that fear that has been attached to it, even when the statistics are in and the numbers are showing this. So that's the problem we're at right now, where actually most societies are in, entertaining more lockdowns and a, a destruction of the small businesses that are already suffering uh, a complete destruction. And I think there is definitely more going on. I think large companies are going to do very well. Um, I think most small companies are going to go away. And I think if the, if this is the way we want to behave as a society, then we need to get used to a world 
where we have no small businesses or local businesses, and we just have large superstores that are international superstores and, 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 and that, that do everything. And so that, that's really where the trend is going. Um, and I think we need to make up our minds whether we want to be a society that lives in fear um, or a society that realizes the world is dangerous. And I'm not saying that there is no virus. I'm not saying the virus is a hoax, but I want people to know that, it, you know, listen to epidemiologists, they would find that coronavirus has been killing people, I think for 60 years, I think 30 something strains of coronavirus, flus, colds, leading to pneumonia. We never cared until this year. <laughs> Most people don't even know that. <laughs> so I think we need to be careful about who is leading us by the nose. Why are they? And I know there's tons of other reasons I think that this is going on. Maybe that's for a different time because it can get really, mm. you know, there's a lot of views on that. But I think for most people, if you're starting to wonder, maybe there's something else going on here than just a virus. And I think, um, I think the harder thing, the, the more, the more, the thing that's more alarming to me is the the censorship takeover and uh, you see people getting shadow banned and even people, notable people like Joe Rogan being banned from YouTube for things. He was trying to have 40, I think 40 physicians come on a show to talk about all the different views on dealing with coronavirus from a medical perspective. And that got me. Right? <laughs> so I think people need to start waking up whether or not they agree with me necessarily. We should all agree on the fact that, we should at least be able to have this kind of discourse in this kind of discussion where we all use our, our common sense and, and, and listen to experts, but also question where's the expert coming from, you know, and that's all part of the process. Anytime you're having a trial in a legal courtroom, when you're, when you're listening to a witness, it's all about, well, does the witness, has the witness been funded by anyone? Has the witness been, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. these are very, these are very common sense, I think, practices for us all to have. So um, my recommendation would be to listen to many different experts and also listen to where their incentives lie and try to figure out if you can find someone that's less incentivized to have an opinion, I think you could probably put more stock in their opinion. The less, the less incentivized, the more neutral, it, you know, it doesn't mean you're always right, but the more you can find people like that, I would hold those people's opinions very, very high. The people that have many different incentives and many different funding incentives, I would listen to them, but with, but take it with uh, a grain of salt, so they, so they say. Um. Yeah, they, they, thank, thank you so much. I, I feel we could continue talking for another couple of hours, but I also want to be respectful of your time. And um, I wanted to ask, is there something you want to share with the listeners or maybe a project or maybe even, um, I mean, we mentioned before that like some of the organizations you're working with, they are um, donation-based, like whatever. Like, is there, is there something you want to share with um, whoever's? Sure. I mean, well, I guess the... The first thing would be our, our team Covenant Rescue Group. Um, we would love to you know, continue to grow that. So anyone that uh, really wants to be behind that initiative, there's uh, a lot more information at covenantrescue.org. Um, we, we wanna continue to grow that. We're doing that around uh, the world now. So we just wanna, we wanna continue to unite veterans. And what I love about it what I love about what we're doing is it's not just about the rescues of the kids, which is so important. It's also about veterans healing. And because a lot of these veterans come out feeling like they didn't get to do what they wanted to do. They didn't get to help at the level uh, that they wanted to help at. So we're finding that veterans that do get plugged into this have a complete transformation um, and have a new sense of purpose, a new sense of community. And so it's as much, you know, it's as much for them uh, as well uh, that, that want to be a part of this uh, righteous war. And so, yeah, that, that would be, uh, I guess, my number one request. I mean, I'm just thankful that you, you took the time to have me on. I know you, you got me going. These are all topics that, you know, you know, 
you know, you pick the topics well because these are things that, that get me going a little bit. Um, but I'm very thankful that, that you have me on to share. Yeah, it is a pleasure. It was a pleasure. And I have the feeling we might have another conversation at some time. And uh, for me, it has been incredible. And uh, I love what you're doing. And uh, I am supporting you in your fight against sex trafficking or human trafficking and for justice and uh, whatever resources we discussed, we will add them to the show notes of this episode. Also, all your contact details, social media details to follow you and know, get to know more about you. And to anyone who is listening to this show, if you like what you, what you heard, please rate us. Please share this information to, to make a difference together. And um, yeah, thank you again for taking the time, sharing your experience, your wisdom, your expertise. And um, yeah, here at Beyond Perception, it's all about empowering people to live self-determined, free and healthy lives. And it is a true honor, pleasure to uh, walk this path together. I have a feeling. And <laughs> I Simon, thank you. Thank you for having me on. I look forward. I, hopefully we have another one coming up soon. Let's do this again. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, Dave.